Oh, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the worst one of them all? No, no, you jerk. I mean the worst graphics card. Oh, right. The S3 Verge. No, we already covered that one. Give me something new. Something truly horrific. Hmm. Textures smooth as pineapple skin. Polly's jumping like an eye twitch. Frame rates as low as your bank balance. Oh, no. No, it can't be. The Alliance AT3D. As we all know, the magic shaving mirror from Ikea never lies. So, in this episode, we take a look at what is probably the worst ever released graphics card from a company that you most likely never heard of. And for good reason. They've never been much of a success in the graphics chip market, and this card was indeed their last attempt at doing so. As always, we'll start with a quick look at the company's history. Alliance Semiconductor is headquartered in San Jose, California, and it was founded in 1985 by brothers Damodar, I hope I'm saying that right, and CN Reddy. In 1977, they left their home country of India to pursue a career in the burgeoning semiconductor business in the United States, studying at universities across the country before joining various prominent companies in the field, such as Fairchild Semiconductor, Four Phase Systems, Synertech, Texas Instruments, and National Semiconductor before finally starting their own firm. Alliance's first product was a high-speed cache memory chip, made for use with Intel's new cutting-edge 386 microprocessors. The company continued this trend in the years following, producing various SRAM, DRAM, and flash memory chips for professional and home PC markets. In July of 1994, the company announced their first graphics chip, known as the ProMotion 3210. It was among the first single-chip solutions available for Windows acceleration. It was intended to be a low-cost GUI accelerator. The ProMotion 3210 was a 32-bit video processor and supported memory interleaving with 2 or 4 megabytes of VRAM, which brought memory throughput to levels akin to many 64-bit chips of the time. Sadly, customers didn't get to enjoy this feature much as the most common and perhaps the only model available was a Miro Video 12 PD, sold with just 1 megabyte of memory. Their second chip released in 1995 was the ProMotion 6410, which upgraded the core to 64-bit. It still retained a 32-bit memory bus, however, relying on memory interleaving as before. Miro didn't even bother to change the name of their card as they simply replaced the existing chip of the Video 12 PD with the newer version. More companies showed interest this time around, but reviewers were not impressed by the lower performance under high color modes and the use of low-cost RAM DACs which didn't allow for visually pleasing refresh rates on CRT monitors of the time. The 6410 was very quickly replaced the very same year by the ProMotion 6422, which finally received a full 64-bit memory bus. And for even further cost reduction, it also integrated the RAM DAC. Most cards with this chipset were sold by budget-oriented companies like Data Expert, and among the fierce competition of that market, Alliance's new chip never saw much success. In July of 1996, they released the ProMotion AT24, with a 128-bit core and an enhanced internal RAM DAC. The memory interface remained at 64-bit, but they reintroduced memory interleaving for a further boost of effective bandwidth. In 1997, the AT24 was selected for use by the well-known board maker Diamond Multimedia in their low-cost 2D solution for that year, priced at just $60. Up until this point, all of Alliance's accelerator chips were designed as low-end 2D solutions, but that was about to change. The 3D accelerator market was calling, and their partnership with 3DFX beginning in November of 1995 would be a critical part of their advancing product line. Alliance's new chip, named AT3D, was announced at Comdex in November 1996, along with the Voodoo Rush from 3DFX. Sporting a 128-bit 2D core based on the previous AT24, it also included a hardware geometry setup engine for offloading those operations from the CPU, and most importantly, a 64-bit VR interface for connecting to the Voodoo Rush chipset. The Voodoo famously lacked any 2D acceleration, and so for the Voodoo Rush, Alliance's AT3D would serve as a built-in 2D card, and when 3D was needed, it switched output to the Voodoo chipset through the VR interface. Voodoo Rush cards came to market in the first quarter of 1997, and unlike Alliance's past 2D efforts, it was very much a success. 
The first model of Voodoo Rush announced was Hercules Stingray 128-3D, and the company had big plans with it. Three versions of the card were planned for release, covering all areas of the market. The most basic version with the AT3D chip and 2MB of memory was still capable of 3D gaming, but only in basic resolutions, for $129. For a little more money, a 4MB version was offered for a still reasonable $159. The most expensive version included the Voodoo Rush as an add-on daughter card for the high-end price of $299. This was the reason why many early revisions of the Voodoo Rush from various companies were found with the second additional PCB. Unfortunately, the AT3D had some serious issues with 3D modes, so Hercules moved towards selling complete cards, and the Alliance's 3D solution was quickly replaced by other chips without the useless 3D capabilities, one of which was the AT25, announced in March of 1997, which Alliance offered alongside the AT3D chips which they now sold on standalone cards. The quote new AT25 chip may have only actually been the AT3D rebranded for use as a 2D chip, presumably because the company had likely amassed a large number of their failed 3D accelerators with no real way of selling them. At least some AT25 cards are detected as AT3D. The AT25 chip was also the company's last one. Alliance announced two new chips in March 1997 with AGP 1 and 2X support, which they codenamed AT3D Plus and AT4D. Whatever a 4D accelerator entailed, we'll never know. With a maximum memory capacity of 16 megabytes, built-in DVD acceleration, and potentially time-traveling capabilities, they could have certainly been interesting low-cost alternatives, but alas, the chips never arrived. In May of 1998, Alliance announced two additional chips, under the names Paladin LT and EX. These were delayed and likely merged into the AT3D Plus and AT4D projects. But this was the last we would hear from the graphics division of Alliance Semiconductor, and it was quietly disbanded after that. Now, with that out of the way, let's get back to our card. The model in question is the VP128 from the Hong Kong-based company Supergrace. Supergrace primarily sold exceedingly cheap products in mostly Russia and Eastern Europe. The memory and core clocks of this card were detected at 61MHz, and it was only offered on the PCI bus, with its sole API support being DirectX. The price and release date are not known, but were probably $100 or less and sold long after the initial launch of the Alliance chip it's based on. Perhaps as late as 1999, offered as a low-cost Windows multimedia accelerator for undiscerning users. The theoretical performance of the chip is unknown, as Alliance didn't specify it anywhere. Even the company's confidential data sheet doesn't shed any light on this information. The only thing we know is that it should, in theory, be capable of high triangle and fill rate performance at 640x480 in 16-bit colors. Our reference, as always, is the 3DFX Voodoo 1 from Diamond, with 4MB of memory at 50MHz. And because our test PC is occasionally too fast for a Voodoo 1, we also used an NVIDIA Riva 128, clocked at 100MHz in its place, for direct 3D games whenever color rendering issues occurred. The drivers for the AT3D have very detailed info screens regarding software version and the card itself. In monitor control, the owner can manually change the refresh rate and screen position. The performance menu only has two options for compatibility. An icon on the taskbar lets you change screen and video gamma settings, but that's it. Nowhere can you find options for 3D settings or clock speeds. Final Reality detects that trilinear texture filtering is missing, which isn't a big issue with graphics cards of this age. What's more problematic are the missing transparency modes, so we can probably expect some ugly looking lights and smoke effects. Oh, the texture filtering tests aren't working at all. Uh, well, let's see if it gets any better from here. So the mech scene is rendering, but very, very slowly, and the flickering seizure-inducing textures littering the entire screen are not a good sign. Excuse me while I pop in a few pain pills.
Oh, good. The city scene shows the horrible texture filtering issue in detail. And for some added spice, we have missing lights and smoke effects, and a frame rate you can count on your fingers. I'm certainly impressed, aren't you? Next is 3D Mark 99, and the score is... well, just look at it. The card is almost dead last despite producing some of the worst image quality to ever grace a computer screen. But you haven't seen anything yet. This is Tomb Raider running on an Alliance AT3D. At least, I think it is. It could also be an impressionist painting by an acid-dropping hippie from the 1960s. And if you stare at it too long, you might start to feel the effects of the drug yourself. At the risk of an epileptic seizure, you might also notice the awful texture filtering and missing water. Because who has time to render puddles when you're creating works of art? And hey, while we're at it, let's forget about the front gate at Laura's estate. Who needs it? Forsaken reduces the insanity compared to Tomb Raider, but shows another glaring issue, garbled and slowed sound. So not only are your eyes bleeding from the jittery frame rate, the horrible texture filtering and blinking triangles, but your ears get a nice dose of pain as well. Using this card is a feast for the senses.
let's start up Shadows of the Empire. Oh, awesome. Well, let's continue anyway. All right, a black screen with stars. That seems normal for Star Wars. Oh, wait, that's the main menu. Where is it? Oh, this should be a piece of cake. If you can manage to get into the game, we're treated to what has become a usual sight for this card. The entire landscape, the vehicles, and the sky are twitching non-stop. Maybe it's twitching from excitement. Maybe it's twitching from pain. Regardless, it's a mess of low frame rates and graphical glitches, badly dithered transparency effects, and that trademark Alliance texture quality. If that weren't bad enough, the AT3D has chosen not to show us any of the HUD elements of the game, or mission dialogue. Interesting, this must be a hidden feature of the cart. We'll call it selective rendering. Warhammer Dark Omen doesn't detect any 3D device at all, and I'm not sure I can blame it. MDK won't even start, which is probably a blessing in disguise. Moto Racer not only starts, but also shows the HUD elements, so that's nice. Of course, you also get all the other issues we've been seeing thus far, but at least the frame rate is... sort of playable? Kinda? You be the judge. Given what we've seen, Croc is a welcome sight, perhaps even shocking. It almost looks, dare I say, normal. I mean, it even manages to render the sky without flickering. Unfortunately, we can't say it's perfect, as we see weird stretching polygons whenever Croc jumps, and transparent textures are dithered as we've seen before. And the frame rate and sound are also horrible, but you probably already noticed that. Thank you. 
Subculture is just one big chaotic mess. Disembodied triangles litter the screen, with only a few parts of the submarine visible and a world largely devoid of any fully rendered models. Thanks to that, the card manages to push a relatively high number of FPS. Another great example of the card's selective rendering feature. Turok is much the same as Subculture, matching the frame rate of its competition by rendering as little as possible. Except now the sound issues are worse. Wing Commander Prophecy doesn't look as bad as some of the previous games. Effects quality is low, but the frame rate is almost playable. Sadly, the audio issues cause everyone to sound like they're talking underwater, or perhaps with an alien voice. I'd almost call this a creative preference, except I don't think anyone would prefer it.
shot! Fuck me. Incoming looks fine, as long as you're not looking at the sky. Unfortunately, the game requires you to look at the sky. A lot. Memory leaks or some other issue cause rendered objects and terrain to leave trails on the skybox resembling the old cursor bug in Windows 95. Apart from that, it's also missing any lighting effects and the helicopter blades, and once again, any of the game's HUD elements. Carmageddon 2 is far too slow to be playable, and it also doesn't look very good with bad transparency, buggy perspective correction, and broken sound. The screaming is particularly nightmarish with the garbled underwater treatment. Alien voices continue in Shogo, which is, you guessed it, slow, ugly, and once it tries to render an explosion, it just sort of gives up and freezes. I would too if I was failing this hard. Alright, let's move. The whole area is going to be slack in about two minutes.
Wipeout really gives you the exhilaration of high-speed racing with a single-digit frame rate. And just listen to those futuristic engine sounds and effects. Another audio and visual masterpiece. Expendable only works when set to 320 by 240. Well, I say works, but that's really a stretch. The game starts up, but then you can't really tell it apart from Subculture or Turok. More abstract geometric painting on a blue canvas. The people at Alliance were truly visionary artists, and they've proven that time and time again. Half-Life is next, and it really makes you long to return to the comfort of software rendering. At least then you'll see the textures, and perhaps even a playable frame rate. Here's Alien vs. Predator. Lighting? Nope. Alpha textures? Nope. Alternate vision modes? Nope. A playable frame rate? Eh, nope. Any sort of decency whatsoever? Yeah, okay, you get the idea.
private. We've got a security breach. Move your... Open the blast doors in here by pulling the override switch. What? With such a stellar showcase thus far, that only leaves one question. Can it run Unreal? Well, the word Unreal is certainly right. Need I say more? I think, at this point, we can come to a conclusion. First, the positives. Um, well, uh, I guess it's a positive that the world's forgotten this graphical abomination, so the possibility anyone would be subjected to its visual and audio atrocities is next to zero. Well, until they watch this video, that is. As for negatives, we could probably break this one up into chapters and publish a book on it. Instead, we'll try and break it down to the basic core issues. Rendering is utterly broken in the vast majority of games. The broken rendering spreads its disease to sound as well in just about every case. When games are at least recognizable, the texture filtering is like sandpaper for your irises. And of course, since they invested so much time making sure DirectX works great, they didn't have time to add OpenGL support. Transparency effects simply aren't supported, and even though 640x480 is technically supported, you'll never find a game playable enough to use it, unless the game makes heavy use of its selective rendering technique, such as subculture. Now to give the card a score. For its esteemed and prime example of everything a graphics card shouldn't do, we award it nothing. Yeah, not a single star. It's almost like it was stuck in a late alpha or early beta stage of development, but somehow made it to market. It shouldn't be used for 3D rendering, and it probably shouldn't be inserted into your computer at the risk of sending your PC into a deep depression with thoughts of ending its own life. I might award it a special place in my trash bin, but that's about it. Well folks, that's it for now. I hope you found this video at least educational. We should note we do not bear any responsibility for headaches, seizures, loss of vision, hearing, or whatever you ate before you clicked on this video. I shudder to think if there's anything worse than this for future episodes, but if you are morbidly curious, stay tuned and find out. For now, here's a super awesome demo of 3D Mark 99 rendered on the current king of worst gaming cards, in case you needed to see more. See you later!